Good morning. Oh, hold on. Good morning, YouTube family. Happy Thursday to you and welcome to Happy Crappy Hour on Escape from Crazy Town. Oh, today I have quite an interesting, um, well, there's so many interesting stories, right? When it comes to narcissists, <laughs> seems like there's always something going on with them. Um, you know, it's heartbreaking and it's sad, but it's also, I mean, I laugh because it's just crazy. It's just absolutely crazy. And if you're not laughing, you might end up crying. <laughs> and not that crying is bad, but, you know, this is why I find some of these things they do so amusing or, I mean, not in a mean way. I'm not like amused by the, their pain or anything like that, but I'm just shocked. You know, I'm just in shock of how or the way they think. But anyway, you guys, good to see you. One zero, good to see you and Matthew. Ah, oh, you're having a rough day. Yeah, I totally want to hear about that. See what's going on there, Matthew. And John Bailey, good, good to see you. Good morning. Yeah, Matthew says it's like one step forward and two back. Yes, it is. It is like that. But the good news is that um, that's only for a time, you know. It does feel like you're going backwards more than you're going forwards at times. But it's just a season. When you start recognizing that one step that you did take forward and you uh, build on that, you're going to take more steps forward and less steps backwards. And yes, even years later, you may, you may still, and it's not just may, it's, <laughs> I'm going to say it's just about likely that you're going to now and again, take a step backwards. So it's inevitable, but the good news is that you, those steps backwards will last far, um, excuse me, you guys, I'm trying to get my dog outside, <laughs> it takes more, far less time um, to recover from, and you're going to be able to bounce back a lot faster. So Matthew, I am with you. I totally understand where you are. I've been there, and sometimes I slip back as well. Sometimes anxiety takes over me, or... Um, the, uh, I don't want to say longing because I don't really long for what I used to have because I know what it is now. I, I'm completely aware and in, filled with the truth about the whole matter. So I don't long for it anymore, but I do look back and I wonder, you know, did I lose a part of myself and how do I get that part back? And that has been a really good question for me to ask myself. And I'm going to get into that with you guys today, actually. So <clears throat> Matthew says, I'm scared of what is coming. Yeah. Yeah. You know, don't, don't be too afraid of the future. Don't be afraid because, I mean, even if there's a battle ahead, you're going to make it through. There is an end to this. And that is just a part of life you know the this battle that's coming up is only a section of your life it's not your whole life so you, we're gonna talk about that i want to hear about your happies and crappies this week you guys you know the happies are things that went well and you want to keep on doing um and the crappies of course are the things that didn't go well and you learn from those and you want to stop doing those things let me see, you guys. One zero says narcs hate educated empaths and they increase, thankfully. <laughs> exactly, I know. This is what I really like about these uh, channels and people who are sharing and you guys coming on and sharing your experiences because we, we learn from one another. We also find out that we're not alone. And then we see, oh my gosh, their tactics are so similar that it equips us for the future, right? When we start seeing somebody behave in a certain way, you go, whoa, I have seen that before and I have heard multiple people talk about that manipulation. So you don't fall for it. Yeah, Matthew says PTSD. Yes, there, you know what? I um, I guess they call it complex PTSD, CPTSD, um, as they veer away from the war zone type of PTSD, where it's like one huge incident that causes PTSD, 
whereas um, most people, if not all people, have some form of CPTSD, complex PTSD, where we've been conditioned in a way over a period of time through um, you know, abuse, continual abuse or continual manipulation or continual um, judgment or uh, critical criticism. It's just attacks, right? And you become sensitive to those things that remind you then of those situations when you were abused or when you were manipulated, um, yeah, in such a bad way or a negative way. So then it comes back to you and you develop this type of anxiety. And I completely understand that. I've been through that, um, was hanging out with a friend yesterday who was talking about her anxieties. Uh, yeah. Rissa Riss says, by the way, hi. <laughs> says, uh, why do I feel hurt? The narc moved on after two months and having a new life, yet he denies his source, but I know he has moved on. I feel empty. Diva R, good to see you. Says, hello, I haven't caught you live in months. I know, Diva, it's good to see you. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, Rissa Riss, you know, yeah, they can deny that they've moved on. They can deny that they have somebody else right now. And we feel empty, you know, part of that empty feeling that you're experiencing right now is partly in your mind because you're building up this, uh, this life that the narcissist has moved on to. And you think that it's, fill, it's fulfilling to them. And you think that it's beautiful and it's exciting and it's everything that you want to have with the narcissist. So that, of course, leaves you feeling like, well, I don't have this with the narcissist, so you're going to feel empty. So part of the battle, and a huge part of it, really, uh, Rissa, is that it's in your head. You have to stop imagining that the narcissist is living some amazing, crazy, wonderful life without you. And as long as you keep imagining them living this beautiful life, you're not going to be focusing on your own possibility right you're not going to be filling your own life oh, the pup wants to come back in so i gotta let him back in you're not going to um, allow yourself to to seek and be blessed by opportunities that are coming your way and yes you're going to feel empty because you're allowing those opportunities to keep passing you by while you're imagining what's going on with the narcissist so if you want to watch this i'll i'll tag it into this video at the top on the right the little eye circle icon when we upload this video <clears throat> but it's called uh, stop imagining life is perfect for the narcissist and the new supply so i will put that out for you and that'll get you started thinking about the way you're thinking right now and how it's sabotaging you jihad good morning good to see you matthew i do want to hear about what it is you're fearing in the future what you're scared about and what what it is you think is coming your way so let's find out about that you guys let's talk about our happies and crappies this week i want to share with you that you know i don't know if it's a crappy or not but it's definitely kind of throw me off a bit my narcissist called me and um this is when, uh-oh, somebody's going to try to get into the picture frame here. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Get, get out. <laughs> I don't know why. Sorry, my dog's trying to get into the picture frame. <laughs> Nipping around. Oh, come here. i got to take off his collar because he loves to shake it when I'm on. I think it's because he wants attention. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm sorry, I'm going to take a second here. My dog has distracted me. Yeah, happies and crappies. So I got a call from my narcissist, one of my narcissists, uh, the major one that I stay in touch with. And for the first time in my life, you know, she, well, she left a message. And for the first time in my life, she says in her message that she's actually feeling, I don't know that she said she was feeling down. But she sounded like she was feeling down. And I was like, wow, she never has ever been real with me. And she said that if I want to talk with her or find out what's going on with her to give her a call back. And I was like, whoa, she actually wants to have, you know, as close as a heart to heart a narcissist can possibly have, I guess. 
uh, with me. And I was intrigued. I was wondering like, wow, what am I going to hear? What is she going to say? So I did call her back. And um, by, you know, at the time that I called her back, it was a couple of hours after she had left me a message. By the time I called her back, she said, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> and that was it. You know, she says, I'm, I'm better now. I don't need to talk. And then I was like, really? I wonder what it is she now has fooled herself into believing in order to escape her, her, I don't know, her incomplete, her empty life. You know, narcissists live a much more empty life than we realize, than we believe they could. They live a far more empty life than we do because they don't connect with people. And for a while, it's okay because they just bounce from people, from person to person, right? They go from group to group and they get supply and attention and they get their ego stroked and they love meeting new people because new people don't know their story, right? So they can go on and on and talk about themselves to new people who are learning about them and they love that attention. Well, you know, even for these narcissists, when they get to a certain age, they cannot deny anymore. They get to really question what's going on with them. Why do their relationships not look like other people's relationships, right? They'll look if they're parents, you know, they have kids. They'll look around at other people who have kids who now have a grown have grown up kids and have a good relationship with their grown up kids. And they'll wonder why don't I have a good relationship with my grown up kids? Um, or why do my relationships with my kids not look like that? You know, why are my kids not all around me and laughing with me and enjoying my company and wanting to spend time with me? They start to question that. And I, even if it's just for a moment, you, you may not even catch it. You, you as the victim or as one of those, one of their supplies may not actually ever see it, but they do. They stop and they think about this. And so it was quite a shock to me that she shared even that bit with me. And I'm going to follow up and hopefully I'll let you know what's going on with that next week. I'm hoping to find out more and see if she really does want to talk and if this nagging feeling that's inside of her about her relationships continues to um, to prick her and if it does then hopefully she'll be able to talk to me and I wonder you know I'm kind of intrigued I'm kind of excited I wonder what will come next anyway I'm just so amazed that this might even be an opportunity but you know what you guys it might not it might just be that she wanted to uh, reach out but only for a moment and I there was just a glimpse of a moment where they act like they need help, but then they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to talk to anybody. They don't want to appear to appear weak in any way. So we'll see about that. So I don't know. That's why I said, I don't know if that's my happy or crappy, you know, it's kind of a uh, borderline. So you guys, uh, let me see how you're doing in here. Um, Lisa says, thank you so much for answering my question. God bless you. Well, God bless you too. Thank you. Um, yeah, one zero says narcs even hate it if you have inner peace. Yeah, well, we're going to jump right into it, you guys. I have these this lesson planned for you. It's it's awesome. I've been um, it, it's a compilation actually. You know, behind every one of my lessons is so much more information that I don't share, but I want to give you the highlights of what I've been learning and what I've been experiencing and what I've been noticing. So there are four things that I, and it's kind of five, I broke, you know, one of them's kind of branched out to two things. So four to five things that narcissists hate the most. And the reason I want to talk to you guys about this today is because once you realize what it is they hate, um, then you can see their manipulation. And the reason for that is because they're going to avoid what they hate, right? They want to control their environment so they don't have to deal with what they hate. So that's where the manipulation comes in. That's where the control comes in. And they have to control their environment to exclude these things that they hate. And once you see that, um, 
their behavior and you know what they hate, then you start to see how the behavior links or is connected to the things they hate because it's a reaction. Their behavior is a reaction to the things they hate. So when they react to the things they hate, they pull you in and they make you a part of their fantasy world to avoid and distract themselves from the things they hate. Okay, let's go into this, you guys. Um, one of you guys kind of hit in on, on it already. And it is seeing others happy. Number one is they hate seeing other people happy or at least happier than they are, right? They can't stand that because they, they compare themselves always. They compare themselves to other people. And they want to know that, they, you know, they believe they deserve the most happiness right? They deserve to be better off than everybody else. So when they see other people happy and it's not because of them and they have no part in it at all, they're not the cause of the other person's happiness, right? They're not the uh, center of that other person's happiness. They're not the, uh, you know, the, they're not the ones of receiving the attention, right? Or the credit for that person's happiness. So they have nothing to do with it. That just makes them crazy. So, you know, sometimes you see these narcissists pretending to be happy. They have to make a show. They have to make you believe that they are happier than you are. So you are you catching this? When you see on social media that they're running off and flitting off to this social event and that social event, and I have all these people who are inviting me to all these things, it's their way of trying to convince you or anybody who's watching that they are far happier than anybody else, right? They're far more popular than anybody else. They are living a much better life and more fulfilling life than, than anybody else. And Rissa, I hope you understand that. If you do catch a glimpse of your narcissist, then I highly recommend you don't, right? I highly recommend you go no contact you don't look them up, you block their social media so you so you don't get these pictures that they're trying to send to you or not send to you, but they're putting out there hoping that you'll look, right? And they want you to think that they've moved on, they have other things going on in their life and they don't need you because their life is so much happier, so much better than yours. It makes them crazy to have a real life, to to actually think that they may not be as fulfilled as you are. So they're gonna to continue to put out this image. And when we, when we fall for this image, we tend to take away from our own life, right? We tend to think that we didn't matter. And this is why I say that it's important to see this because it affects us. It affects our attitude. It affects how we feel about ourselves right? When we compare to what we're seeing over there, when we, we are comparing to what's going on with the narcissist. And you just can't, don't compare to that because what they're living is a fantasy. It's not real. You're comparing to a dream, your, your real life to a dream. So don't do that. Um, so number one, again, you guys are seeing others happy or happier than themselves. That makes them crazy. And they learn ways to convince themselves and convince others. And that's part of their manipulation, you guys, right? That, um, that they put out there that they use to control other people because they don't want other people to believe that the other people are happier than themselves, right? It, the reason for this is because it triggers their jealousy and it triggers their victim mentality. And if they see other people doing better than they are or uh, living a more fulfilling life, they start to feel like a victim. They start to feel like, you know, I deserve to be happy. So how dare that other person is getting what I should be having, you know, should, is getting the attention and I should be on top of the world, not them. You know, it, it's this, and they feel somehow victimized by that, you know, by other people's happiness. So crazy. Number two, let me, See actually what you guys are saying before we get to number two. Um, 
Hold on, you guys. Let me go down. Diva R says, I found out the ex married, oh, ex narc married a mail order bride in some poor foreign country. Yeah. I am happy about that because now maybe he will leave me alone and stop stalking me. The level of desperation is sad. I know, you know, I do not. I met somebody who has, uh, not a, I guess, a kind of a mail order bride. You know, they met. They met somebody, I don't remember where she's from. I think she's like from Russia or Ukraine or something like that. Some country that's not doing economically great, okay? Probably Ukraine. And she has a child. Anyway, he believes that this is a real relationship that she's getting into with him, right? He's convinced. And she's, I think, 10, 15 years younger than him. Um, at least, probably 15 to 20 years younger than him is what I want to say. And she's good looking, let me tell you, right? Um, a lot of a lot of these women from poorer countries or countries that are not doing well economically or um, politically, their governments are unstable. They want to escape to a better life. They want stability, especially if they have children, right? And this woman does. She has a child. So she wants to get her child out of that environment and into the United States where there's a possibility for them to have a stable and good life, right? Um, and a future. So of course she's not, she's going to be happy that an American man would want her or a man from a Western country would want her and would has the means to take care of her. Now he's not super rich, but compared to her country, he is, right? Um, so, uh, you know, when I see that and I've met the guy and he seems like a, a, an okay guy, but it just creepiness, creepy, ewy, ickiness, just kind of, it, it doesn't seem right to me, right? That this is the circumstance under which you're going to start a relationship. Someone who is desperate to get out of their economic situation is not the way to catch a love of your life. And these guys who do that are desperate. They want somebody who's going to appreciate them, but they're not appreciating them. They're using them. And then these men come out saying, I can't believe these women used me. Like, well, what were you doing? You were trying to catch these women, promising them that you'll take care of them economically and take them out of their, um, of their poverty or their desperation, their desperate situation. What was it that you thought you were doing this for, you know, I don't think they were doing it altruistically where they were just going to give this person a better life and a home and security and safety and take care of their kids and um, not expect, say, physical, right? <laughs> Something in return, uh, a woman to fawn over them, a woman to uh, please them, you know, it, it's just, ah, uh, it may not be a narcissist situation, it may be just a situation of desperation on both sides, honestly, but it is not a good situation. It just just is a setup for a huge train wreck. Ah, it's such a huge train wreck. And a lot of times, too, these guys, and I hate to say just men because I wonder there are women out there, too, especially nowadays, where women are becoming more and more mobile, um, upward mobile right? They are getting really good jobs, a lot more women managers, a lot more women um, in the science and medicine, you know, fields, and they are making more money than a lot of men now. So they're the ones who are promising to take care of the men and these narcissistic men or user men or whatever you want to say, uh, desperate men are latching on to women who have very solid, secure careers, and they want those women to take care of them. I mean, it's interesting that these roles are being, uh, you know, reversed. But the main thing is that it, you don't have to be a man. You don't have to be a woman to be a narcissist. You don't have to be a man or a woman to be in a desperate situation and need somebody to pull you out of it or um, hope that somebody will take you out of it. Uh, and you end up with a business contract. You know that I've said this before in some other videos, but what desperate people have or narcissist or toxic relationships have is a business contract. It is not love. It is you do this and I will do that. 
you know, you compromise with each other for things, but then in the long run, you never actually love one another. You never actually um, bonded with the other person as an entire whole person. And you end up just using them for what they can give you, right? You, you take from them what, what you were desperate for. Each side. I'm not blaming one side or the, the other. But yes, Diva R, you said you dodged a major bullet. You absolutely did. You did. Matthew says your NARC probably lost some money. Oh. Oh, on my end? Oh, wow. Maybe. You know what? That's true. I think that when the narcissist also sees that they're not doing as well as they, you know, they're, they're rich people out there, right? Some, I'm not saying all of them are like this, but there are some narcissists who are rich and they did well and they have a lot of money, but then as their money starts to dwindle away, so does their power and their impact and their control over people. Because, you know, hard, sad to say, but money does affect people. People love to be around someone who can pay for dinner all the time or someone who can pay for the vacations all the time or someone who can um, help them out with their bills. You know, people are attracted to that or they like to be around someone who's dressed really well and wears, you know, expensive watches and uh, I don't know, you know. Uh, we will get to this part of it, by the way, later on because these are some hard questions. It'll follow into some hard questions you have to ask yourself later on. So number two, you guys, is that the narcissist hates is when you don't believe them. Yes, they hate it when you don't believe them, um, even though they're lying to you. I mean, they can be totally lying to you, but they expect you to still believe them because they want complete and total loyalty from you. They just can't even understand why, you know, uh, you would not be loyal to them. This is their crazy, this is so disjointed. It makes absolutely no sense to me. And it's one of those things I do laugh about. I'm just like, what? What are they thinking? How can they think that, you know, they're lying to me bold face? Say they borrowed your car, right? And you know your car had no dents in it when you loaned it to them. They bring it back and they drive up to your driveway, right? And there's a huge dent in the door or there's a huge you know, dent in the front or back or whatever. And they'll try to convince you that it was there before and that they did not cause this. This is how insane their lying is. It's like so obvious and yet they want you to believe it. They expect you to believe it. It is a total manipulation, you guys. And when they do that, you start to feel like, wait, am I, am I going insane? Am I not... You know, and some people call it gaslighting, but gaslighting is more subtle. Gaslighting is, you know, they do get you to, you know, question because it's possible that you didn't see or that you didn't do or whatever it was that they're gaslighting you about, right? But full out narcissistic lying is so blatant that they expect you to completely, like they could have their arms around their the person they're cheating with, right, on you and tell you there's nothing going on between us. And they'll even kiss the person in front of you and say, see, there's nothing going on between us. <laughs> they, and then here's the crazy thing about us. And this is, and maybe I'm, t I'm tipping on it already, right? I'm touching on it already because I cannot help myself. A question you have to ask yourself is what, why am I even tempted to believe this person when I know 100% that they are lying to me? That's a hard question. Why am I even tempted to believe them when I know without a doubt they are lying to me? And part of that, you guys, has to do with your own self-esteem, right? Your own belief in yourself. You are robbing yourself. You are sabotaging yourself when you allow somebody to convince you of something so blatantly wrong that it's right you know um you have so in order to fix that you have to go inside of yourself and ask why was i even tempted why did i even want to believe that you know and part of it is want too right say the person's cheating on you and you want so badly to believe they're not cheating on you even though you see them 
with their arm around the their the person they're cheating with and you're thinking and holding hands with them you know and they're just saying well you know we're just very affectionate people you know you're not affectionate enough and so i have to get affection and it's just that we're just touching for affection because that's my love language you know they'll lie to your face and you know it's a lie everything inside of you says this is total bs right and yet you want so badly to believe them and it, part of that is because maybe a part of you needs them right part of you even if they're cheating on you you still want them so you have to ask yourself that what's going on here where is my self-worth why am i so desperate for to believe this lie and we'll go into that a little bit more later on so number two was you don't believe that it drives them nuts they hate it when you don't believe them when you question them right when they tell you no i didn't stop off at a bar no i didn't i didn't stay out all night at some woman's house or some man's house i was with my friend i was with my best friend or i was at my parents house and you know they expect you to believe them because they expect you to to be their servant they expect you to be a good supply that follows along and supports their narrative of their life and when you break away from that it makes them so angry that they start trying to control you even more then comes out the insults right um they'll say things like um yeah you're such a jerk that you won't believe me you you know you are you're so pessimistic or you're so critical you know, so they'll start calling you names for being a jerk for not believing them. When you see that reaction come out of you not believing them, when you understand that they hate it when you don't believe them, then you'll see that that's a manipulation. Then you'll recognize each time they start to call you names for not going along with their story that, that this is a manipulation, right? So you don't fall into it. You don't start feeling bad. You don't start believing their lies about how terrible of a person you are for not believing them. And if you love them, you would trust them. And, you know, all this crap, right? It, those are manipulations. That's what they do in reaction to you not believing them. Now, the easy thing or the um, healthy thing, right, um, that, would, that would be in a relationship, let's say, um, when you don't believe somebody and you're just like, no, I, I know this isn't true. And I'm not talking about big blatant lies. I'm talking probably about the gaslighting stuff. The, the person would actually want to prove to you like, oh yeah, you know, um, that what happened, you know, that their story is accurate. Or they might be like, oh, you caught me, <laughs> you know, you're right. You know, and they confess to what it is they did. I did take your lipstick or I did, um, you know, take your keys without you, you know, without letting you know, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll bring it back. Or they shouldn't even be taking your keys, by the way, that's so weird. But um, something less, you know, I did eat your pie, you know, your last slice of pie and, uh, you know, uh, without asking you. So in a normal, healthy relationship, they would confess to it. Or if they're telling you what they're telling you is the truth, they would actually give you evidence that it's the truth. Like they would have no problem giving you evidence like, oh, well, you need evidence. OK, sure, I'll show you. But a narcissist has to protect their lie and the way they protect their lies by manipulating the person they want to believe their lie and they'll attack, they'll guilt you, they'll criticize you, they'll get you to question yourself. And, you know, it comes right back to, again, your self-esteem. Where is your self-esteem that you did not or could not resist and stand up to the narcissist lies right so you guys that's number two i'm going to recap all of this too at the end so we have the, the whole picture all together see thomas good to see you oh hey you guys i'm going to change this to live chat i always forget to do that um yeah because sometimes uh, when i get on to youtube they automatically set it on top chat so I don't automatically see, see everybody's comments and YouTube through whatever calculation decides which comments I'll see and which ones I don't see. Cassie Jansen, I did not even see you earlier. Um, good to see you. Says they always 
They're always cheating, running from one supply to another. Yeah. Yep. Because, you know, new people means new attention. And they can tell their same old stories to new people because they haven't, haven't heard the stories yet. And also they haven't caught on to the fact that the narcissist is a terrible person. And they give the narcissist the benefit of the doubt, right? So the narcissist gets to play this horrible manipulative game with them. You guys, let me go back. There are a lot of comments here I did not see. Um, <clears throat> wow, see Thomas, you were on here earlier and it did not show me that you were. So let me go back, you guys. Okay, Janaya, good to see you. Good morning. Um, Diva says, he is so desperate to have any interaction with me and for me to reach out. I truly don't care. I feel sorry for him. I moved on ages ago. He bores me. Yeah. See, Thomas says, my narc was not happy when I said I'm going back to school. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You know, when you pursue things that make you happy, that has nothing to do with them, they cannot stand it, you know, because they're not the center of attention. Thank you for bringing that, that up. That is one of the big things, too, is when, and it leads, it leads to you having a better life, right? It leads to you not um, being dependent on them. And that's why they don't like it when you do things for yourself that will set you financially free, like going back to school or moving um, into a, a higher position at work that pays you more. Instead of being happy for you, they're angry because they're starting, they feel like they're starting to lose control over you. And that's when they start to manipulate you more and start to bring you down and tell you you're not good enough and tell you you're not going to be able to do this and you're too old to do that. You know, though, uh, the barrage, right, of manipulation that comes out of them after that. I'm going to look. I'm, Diva says, it won't last. He isn't even wealthy, so I can only imagine the lies he told this woman to get her to marry him. Oh, my gosh. Yes, and that will come out, too. You know, these mail-order brides, they come over here, and they think that this person is far better off than they thought, and they come to find out that this person is only using them for, you know, physical intimacy and uh, wanting to control them because they want a slave. They want someone who's there and to take care of them at home and feed, you know, do whatever. Pretty much be their maid and, uh, you know, what else? <laughs> yeah. But here's the deal. Sometimes the, there are guys who really, truly are lonely. And these women over there, you know, because not all of them are innocent and sweet. These women over there, what they're planning to do is come over here and they learn our laws. They know that if they're married, or if they are with a person for a certain number of years and they are separated, they get separated, they get to have half of everything. Oh my gosh, yeah. To think that these people are all innocent is crazy. It's not, it, it's a dangerous game that they play and they're playing it with their heart, right? They're playing it with their finances. They're playing it, this very intimate game of relationship, marriage, um, parenting with people who, uh, I don't know how to say it, you know, that they really don't know. On either side, both of them don't know what they're really getting. Yeah. C. Thomas says, after my narc left for an ex, he hoovered for a year, pretended he was happy on social media. Yep. Then the calls would come, how miserable he is. So I knew it was all fake. That goes right back, right, to point number one. Um, I'm sorry, I'm probably because I'm, I'm behind a bit here in comments, but that's in reaction to point number one, where they cannot stand to see other people happy. They have to portray to the outside world that they are doing much better and they are much happier than everybody else. Yeah, Diva R says they all follow the same playbook. They are never happy. Yeah, Diva says, um, it just confirms how crazy and vindictive this individual is to actually get married and lie to someone just to get back at me. And you know what? It's to get back at you, but this other person serves other 
benefits or other purposes for the narcissist as well. So you're part of the reason and they will use this person to make you feel like they found somebody better and they're so much happier and, you know, they're not the problem because they were able to move on. Yeah. This person serves so many purposes for them. It's not, that's why we don't look, right? That's why we just ignore that, which, by the way, let me see. I'm trying to see if this comes to number three, but not really. Oh, here it is. Yeah, it kind of does. Number three, it starts off in a kind of obvious thing. Obviously, narcissists do not like to be criticized, right? We know that, but that's not really my number three. What really angers them is when you don't take them seriously and you laugh them off or you don't play by their rules, that makes them absolutely crazy because they hate it when people don't take them seriously, right? They hate it when people are not hanging off of every word they say. They hate it when their opinion is not as valued as somebody else's opinion, right? How dare you not think that my opinion about everything, politics, about child rearing, about finances, about how to clean your home. Oh my gosh, they're so full of advice, right? They want to tell you how to do everything in your life. And they're shocked that you don't want to take on all of their advice. They're, it angers them. It makes, you know, they hate that because they think that they are so much smarter than everybody else. They think that they are so much better than everybody else. And everybody else should be looking to them for wisdom, right? Which, oh my gosh, I've seen people give horrible advice, horrible advice out there. And I just cringe because I think, oh my gosh, some people are following these people. Okay, one bad advice I heard recently was, um, you know, people calling into this uh, kind of a Dear Abby helpline type of thing, you know, consulting show and saying that, you know, that they love the spouse that they're with, you know, the person that they married is just wonderful, kind, stable, considerate, um, loving, all this stuff, right? Just perfect. This person is just wonderful. Nothing wrong with them. But I'm just bored. I don't know that I want to stay. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what's the person going to advise them? And the person advised them to go. I was like, what? what? You're in a position to actually give them some insight, have them question, you know, ask a few more questions before they just leave, right? But the the advice was, oh, you know, they they don't deserve someone who um, who is wanting to leave and who is questioning whether um, there's something better out there. So you should just go and see what else is out there because obviously this person is not fulfilling all of your needs and I was like wow what a selfish self-centered horrible bit of advice that was so you know there are people out there who give horrible advice but they expect you to follow it because for some reason they think that they are more wise <laughs> than others they think that they have the experience in their life that worked out for them maybe when they left but I'm like, I'm wondering if it really worked out for them, you know, because life is not over, by the way. Um, your relationship with the, uh, let's, anyway, this person who is giving advice, I don't think was even telling the truth about her own life. I don't think she was telling what really happened in her first marriage. Um, because she also said she left a perfectly good person. <laughs> but here's the backstory that nobody is questioning this person about. Her backstory is she was a heroin addict. And from what I can tell, she married the first one pretty much right after high school. And I'm wondering, were you a heroin addict? But it sounded like she was a heroin addict in her early 20s. So I'm thinking, okay, were you a heroin addict with your first husband? So you're not telling us the whole story. Like he wasn't just this really awesome, nice, wonderful, pleasant guy. He was also doing drugs with you. And 
at some point you realize like, you know, I, this is not working out. <laughs> at some point you realize that you're not, this is a horrible connection to have with a person. This is not the best connection, right? For a relationship or foundation. So you leave. And of course your second husband isn't doing drugs. You have a family now, things are much better. But you look back on your first husband, you think, well, you know, he was a really nice guy, never abused you. Um, you know, anyway, I just kind of wonder, you have to be so careful about the advice people are giving you when they say things turned out well for them, um, but they don't give you the whole story of what they actually left. And then they expect to give you advice based on a little bit of information that you give them, and you're, they don't see the whole story there either. Anyway, I've also heard of other stories where, you know, the woman left a perfectly great guy who was great to her kids, who was like so loving to her kids. Her kids loved him, thought of, you know, their own father was not in their life and they loved him. He, he would help them with homework. He would cook for them. He would take them to the park. You know, he, he watched movies and all the Disney movies with them. Um, but she ended up going after the neighbor because the neighbor uh, was attract, you know, uh, not attractive. I want to say the neighbor was flirting with her. And so they lived in an apartment building. So the neighbor is like literally right down the hall from her right next door. So they started a relationship and she ended up kicking out the first guy. She ends up going to jail because the second guy was a total criminal you know he pulled her into his criminal activities and she got caught and they she ended up going to jail of course losing six years of her life um not being able to be a mom to her children she comes out of jail and she says she wished she had stayed with the first guy she knew that that first guy was the best thing that ever happened to her and that he loved her well and she not just her he loved her kids and then she says you know had she stayed with him her life wouldn't have taken such a horrible turn. So you guys, I just want to share that with you because there are so many people out there who give you terrible advice and they expect you to follow it. Narcissists will expect that you go in and not question their advice, but also think that their advice is great. It's absolutely nuts. Absolutely nuts. But when you laugh it off and you're like, what? Are you serious? No way. I'm not going to just run off. I think I'm going to go to um, maybe marriage counseling with my spouse and see what it is that I need from my spouse. Maybe it's excitement, you know, and my spouse will probably want to step up and be exciting for me and can learn that. Oh, my gosh. I, it's just amazing to me when narcissists give such horrible, horrible advice. So, you guys, I know I'm missing a bunch of comments here, but... <laughs> You're awesome. You guys are so awesome. I just, I love that you guys are talking to each other and helping one another. This is so good. Let me go down. Um, Thomas says uh, her ex was not wealthy either. His supplies are for money or st stability, unless it runs out. Yeah. So you know, sometimes the it's the guy who's latching on to a woman for financial stability. Yeah, Jihad says, one time my ex told me something so horrible that no way it was possible. She got so mad that I didn't believe her and said, what, you calling me a liar? Yeah, right? Then they turn it on you. They tell you how horrible a person you are to not believe them. Or they tell you um, that if you love them, you would believe them. Oh uh, my gosh. They should be able to have some evidence, right? They should be able to show you that what they're saying uh, is actually true and they should have no problems giving you evidence of it you know they'll be like okay this is how you'll know this is you know, I'll give you receipts I'll show you pictures I'll you know uh, they'll have evidence of what they're telling you about and if you don't believe them then you know what over time you, you'll start to see like oh this person is trustworthy I can believe some of the things you know these things that they're saying it's you build trust you don't just automatically trust for no reason but narcissists will expect you to trust for no reason that's the loyalty so number three again you guys uh, so number two was that you don't believe them even though they're lying straight to you 
Uh, number three was um, what angers them is that you don't take them seriously and you laugh them off. When they're trying to tell you to do things the way they want you to do it and you just go, uh, no, I don't think so. Oh, yeah, for instance, you must invest in this this one company and I know it's great and I, it's what I'm putting all my money into or they're the ones starting a, a business and they want you to invest in their business, right? And you go, ah, uh, no, thank you. And not that you necessarily laugh them off, but you dismiss it, right? You dismiss their suggestion. And it's not a suggestion. They, they're trying to get something out of you. They need your support in whatever way. And you dismiss it. They will, it just frustrates them. It makes them so angry. And this is the one that I thought, you know, might have sounded kind of mean because you're telling them no. You know, a lot of empaths have a hard time telling people no because you feel guilty. You feel like, oh, I'm, uh, I, I'm not giving them what they need. Well, here's the deal. It's not what they need. It's what they want. And it's okay to not give someone something just because they want, want it, right? There are things that you want in life and you're not getting it. Are you destroyed? No, right? These are just wants. So give yourself a little bit leeway. Be kinder to yourself in allowing yourself to say no. And that rolls back again, you guys, to self-esteem. What is it in you? That's not letting you say no to people, right? When they want to borrow your car and you really don't want to loan them your car. Why can you not say no? It's okay to say no. There are other things they can do. They can ask other people. They can ask their own relatives. They can go rent a car. They can get their life back in order and do the right thing so that they are not carless, okay? They, you know, I understand once in a while something happens, their car breaks down and um, they need to borrow a car. I get that. I've been in that situation. But narcissists are people that you don't want to loan to because you know they're not going to be responsible with, with your stuff. You know they're just using it. They, you know they're just using you. And then you know that they're lying to you and you know you're not going to get it back, you know, say borrowing money. They just want to borrow a couple hundred dollars to get them through uh, rent, right? To help pay the rent or get them through the month. They just want to borrow, but they're not borrowing it. You know, you're never going to see that money again. So say no, it's okay to say no. And here you guys go again. Um, they hate it when you don't go along with their suggestions and their requests and whatever they're saying, right? You laugh it off, you don't take it seriously, or you dismiss it. That's saying no. That's part of saying no. I don't want to get pulled into this drama with you. I don't get want to be pulled into this problem that you have. And it's only a problem to them. And it's not an insurmountable problem, by the way. We think, oh, if we don't help them, there's no way they can get through this. That's not true. It's If we don't help them, they will still get through this. Life will still go on. If they don't have a car today, they will live. They, it'll be okay, you know? If they need an ambulance, they'll call 911. What I'm saying is that you don't have to feel like you are obligated or indebted or you have, you're the only one who can help them. But they're going to manipulate you to think that you are. That's the manipulation. Once you understand that they cannot stand it when people don't give in to their requests right away, they're going to manipulate you to try to get you to give in to their requests. So that's number three, you guys. Let me see what you guys are talking about here and what your comments are. Cassie, good to see you, says uh, they have no remorse whatsoever. They're dangerous, demonic creatures. Uh, you know what? I do believe there's something wrong in their head. Um, I don't think it's a demonic thing necessarily. And it could be, who knows. But I think that there's something inside of them because some people think, oh, if you just pray enough, they'll change. If you um, read enough Bible passages to them or take them to church or to synagogue or to the mosque or, you know, they believe like this person will eventually change. And I don't think they can. I think there's something inside of their head. And that's why it's really important that 
the narcissist wants to change. And that will show you right then, you know, that it's not a narcissist. This person is not a narcissist. They're actually narcissistic because they have traumas or they have inclinations that make them like that or experiences, right, that make them like that. But they're not necessarily a narcissist. They can, some of them, change, right? And those are not demonic people. They're just people who are not ever socially uh, brought up so in, a so in an environment to be socially adept. Right to to be part of humanity to contribute to the community. They're not brought up in that way. They're brought up in a way that enabled their self centeredness and their selfishness. So those people could possibly be changed when they are ready. Right, and they have to choose it. They have to actually want to change, you guys. So. Uh, that's another, you know, lesson for another time, because a lot of people do ask, you know, can narcissists be helped? And I do want to talk about that at some point in another video. Let me see. Diva R says, the ex-narc is trying to make me jealous, but he majorly downgraded. I feel sad for him and her. This makes me even more determined to keep him out of my life. Yes. You know, when you can see their manipulation, when you can see that they're doing things to try to make you jealous or try to elevate their um, status, you see it, right? Once you realize what it is that they hate, they hate it when people, uh, when it appears as if they're doing worse than other people. So they cannot have that appearance. They cannot have that appearance unless they are trying to manipulate you to help them. Then they'll give into that a little bit so that you feel bad for them in order to help them or give them what they need. Cassie says they always, are, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Where am I now? <laughs> sorry, Diva says if they're talking, they're lying. Yeah, if their lips are moving, then they're lying. Uh, Yeah, Rissa says, the narc's telling people my self-esteem is low, and that's why things never lasted. Well, Rissa, I have um, some suggestions for you, and some questions you want might want to ask yourself as well, is maybe your self-esteem was low, right? That's not the entire reason things don't work out, but that is not a good thing, right, to continue on with. So ask yourself. You know, do you have low self-esteem? I, I don't know that you do. I don't know that the nar narcissist knows this. But ask yourself, do I have low self-esteem? Am I jealous of others? Um, why do I want, you know, why do you behave the way you do the thing? Why do you do the things that you don't want to do, right? Like giving in to manipulation or being um, guilted or shamed. You know, ask yourself, do I have low self-esteem? And if you do... And a lot of people don't have the healthiest self-esteem. They're either too arrogant or they're too low in their self-esteem, right? So a healthy balance really requires you to continually work on that, continually check yourself that you're not being arrogant, but then you're also not um, being too hard on yourself, right? That, it, it makes such a big difference in relationships because low self-esteem does affect relationships. It makes you, um, oh, there, there are a couple of different things that will happen when you have low self-esteem. One is that then you try to subconsciously build up your self-esteem. and You become um, demanding or you get, you get triggered when your self-esteem gets um, challenged, right, or hurt. Then you might appear more emotional than you should, you know, you make things bigger than they really are because you take offense big time, not just you, but I'm just saying people, uh, because I know that when my self-esteem is real low, I get, I take offense much more easily. And the offense may not really be as big as I think it is. It may not even be an offense, but I'll take it that way. So I wanna make sure that my self-esteem is healthy. And when my self-esteem is healthy, guess what? I'm not so easily offended. Um, people can even try to be offending me. I have no idea. I'm, I be, actually become oblivious to it. So it doesn't even affect me. It doesn't affect my relationships. I don't bring it home and take it out on my husband, you know, 
um, yeah, low self-esteem can cause major problems inside of a relationship. So that's one way it does. Another way that low self-esteem causes problems in a relationship is that it makes you an enabler. And what I mean by that is a narcissist will be able to manipulate you, to trust them, believe them, go along with them because you don't trust yourself, right? You don't believe in yourself. So they must be the right ones. They must be the ones that have the answer. So you follow them, you enable them. Or they, if you have low self-esteem, they know that they can shame you or guilt you into doing things because people with low self-esteem um, also feel guilty and feel ashamed about things a lot more than people with healthy self-esteem, right? So the narcissist will shame you and guilt you and be able to manipulate you so much more easily. I'll give you an example. Uh, and this is just a parent example, okay? Um, a kid will say to the parent, you know, everybody else uh, gets to stay out to 2 a.m. and I don't get to stay out till 2 a.m. You hate me. Now, the parent would, and part of it is self-esteem, part of it is other things, but let me explain the self-esteem part. The parent is feeling like they're not a good parent. The parent knows that they did not maybe give the kid every financial, um, what is it, financial benefit, I guess, that other parents might have given their kids, right? They're comparing themselves to other parents and feeling like they are shortchanging their kid. So when the kid manipulates them into thinking you're a bad parent because other parents are allowing their kids to stay out to 2 a.m. And I don't understand why you're not letting me stay out to 2 a.m. Um, if you're a parent with low self-esteem and low self-worth, you're going to probably give in to that. You're, and, you know, you feel guilted. And this is enabling, by the way. This enables narcissists to get from their supply what they want. I'm going to go into that a little bit more later on, but there's a, there's a reason for that. And I'll touch on it right now. It's called a neurosis, all right? We all have neuroses. And our neuroses come from wounding or from training or this complex PTSD. We've been trained in a way to react and be triggered by guilt or um, by shame or by fear. And narcissists know that. They, can, they know they can use guilt, shame, and fear to mani manipulate people who have that wounding or that self-doubt, all right? Boy, I'm really going into a lot of things today, but I want to um, share with you guys number four before we get on too far. Ah, it's already an hour, but as you know, some of you who've been with me, I'm taking a happy crappy hour to an hour and a half nowadays because it seems like there's so much more that we need to talk about than can fit into just one hour, and that's why I... I'm taking this a little bit longer, but let me catch up with some of your comments. Yeah, T. Thomas says they can't bond with you. I know it's a comment from way back a while ago. Yeah, yeah, an aging narc, aging narc is the epitome of desperation. Diva R, I think you are right about that. As they age, they get to a point where they just cannot manipulate, control, or um, uh, project as effectively as they used to, right? Their supply starts to dry, to dry out. And their pool of supply is not as big as it used to be. Yeah. Ah, yeah, see, Thomas says, I would just agree with him, even though I knew it was a lie, because it's useless. It's useless to argue with them, right? And you give in to their lies. That's, you know, uh, I'm going to recap for you guys all of this. You guys are totally following along and your examples are dead on. It's just spot on, you guys. Uh, Cassie says, my daughter is already one year and he still doesn't care. So cold and pathetic. Yeah. yeah. T. Thomas says, if you, challenge, if you challenge them, it becomes a problem. Yeah, they don't like it when you challenge them. They don't like it when you don't listen to them or think that, or take their advice, right? 
uh, and this is about their lies. Uh, C. Thomas says, I stopped being loyal to his lies and he eventually discarded me, but I wasn't going to put up with that. Did me a favor. Yes. It's so true, right? If you stop believing their lies and you stop giving into their lies and you stop uh, giving into their demands and you discard their, they're not even really requests or advice, their their commands, you know, uh, their direction for you that they they expect you to follow. When you stop entertaining those directions and you dismiss them, the narcissist will go crazy. They just cannot handle that. They can't understand. They they can't have a conversation with you. You know, they can't have a, a an honest conversation with you where you actually have a brain you know or they actually believe you have a brain and you can think for yourself and you have um worth you know they, they just can't see that it's oh so crazy okay wow Janae says they are always miserable they won't let won't let me drive got my license then then he sold the car won't let me work won't let me talk to another man won't let me read or watch educational tv yes that's what happens in years later. I know I have a friend whose dad did the same thing to her mom. He would not let her drive, didn't let her have a job outside of the house. And, you know, she looks back at her life now. They're divorced, but she looks back at her life now and she wished that she had taken the job back when they were first married. And even a few years after that, he wouldn't let her work. Um, and part of that's because they want to control you. They want to make sure that they are your entire life and you are completely dependent on them. And her mom was. Her mom was completely dependent on him. And he was extremely abusive to her mom. Oh, look at that. Janae says, I earned my BA and married a good man who was a university professor. Oh, that's fantastic. Santoshi, good to see you. Yeah, says, terrible liar, manipulator, no shame, guilt, just left and betrayed me, married another woman. And when he smelled the truth about him, was, I'm, try, I'm trying to read this because maybe this is not English. Is, okay, when he smelled the truth about him, he was coming, wait, tried to exploit me, my mind. I, I'm not quite sure how <laughs> this says. But it sounds like when uh, the supply learned about you, learned the truth about you, the supply tried to t contact you, which then pissed off the narcissist. <laughs> yes. Cassie says, a narc will never be happy. He will always find fault and push you to discard them or they discard you. My ex-narc psychopath borderline hates me because I could see through him. Yes, right? They hate that. Yep. Well, you guys, I am going to skip for you a little bit. Everything they portray on social media is a lie. They are miserable and trying to convince themselves that they are happy. So true. Oh my gosh. Yeah, Jihad says, my ex always took bad advice from bad people, never taking the good advice from good people. I never understood why. Oh my gosh. Narcissists give such horrible advice. And not only that, they also take bad advice. Because they are horrible judges of character. They're, they don't judge. Uh, yeah, their judgment is so skewed and messed up that they can only, they want what they want. And if your advice goes against what they want and doesn't deliver what they want, then your advice must be bad. So they're going to look for someone who's going to give them the advice that goes along with what they already wanted to do in the first place. So it's not that they're looking for advice. They're just looking for someone to agree with what they wanted to do in the first place. Like, for instance, people who are looking for um, uh, advice from their friends, whether they should cheat or not on their spouse, <laughs> insane, insane. They're not going to listen to the ones who are telling them not to cheat because they're, already, they're, they're already building themselves up to cheat. So they cannot hear. And... For narcissists, it's different than um, people who are just tempted. People who are just tempted, uh, you can reach them. 
you know, maybe not the first time, but you can definitely, you know, I've had friends like this where you can talk to them a few times and they will snap out of it. They might not snap out of it the first moment you tell them not to go to, for their temptation, right? Not to give into their temptation. But uh, the second or third time that you have a conversation with them, they start to come, come around and you stick with them and they will be so grateful that you stuck with them and that you helped them not to do the thing that they were tempted to do. Well, narcissists are the opposite. Narcissists will not come back to listen to you once you've told them no, once you disagreed with what they wanted to do, once you told them not to give into their temptation, then you have no good advice at all to give them, according to them, right? They will not want to hear you. So that's why they kind of seek each other out. And oh my gosh, I've seen it on social media. I've seen it on YouTube where groups of people will collect together to give each other horrible advice. And I'm thinking, how are you guys ever going to live a good life? You're telling each other to use other people. You're telling each other that, you know, you're so good and you're so smart and you're the best thing that other people can possibly ever have. So they don't deserve you and they're just going to use you anyway. So might as well use them first. You know, this is the kind of cr uh, cruddy advice they're giving each other. Oh my gosh, you guys. But the good news is there are still some people out there giving good advice and still some people out there give, giving advice from living a good life, right? From the good life that they do have there, you can see it works, you know, how they live their life works because their relationships are good and they're healthy. Oh, you guys. Oh, so many, so many things, you guys. Yeah. Eva says they're uh, unhappy dark energies. And they do. They do carry around a dark energy about them. Oh, Eva says life is so much better once you get away. Oh, yes. <laughs> you said that you're glad you're out of the horror show. Kind of reminds me of um, the other metaphors I used about being in a relationship with a narcissist. is like being in a horror movie. Ah. Uh, Slim Jim, good to see you, says Narc's advice, <laughs> quote unquote advice, is usually a subtle sabotage. Oh my gosh, yes. Ah, uh, it's horrible. And another reason I think that narcissists give some, some of the times they give bad advice is they want to sabotage you. They, want, they don't want you to do well. So they're going to tell you not to go for that degree. <laughs> they're going to tell you no, maybe now is not the time to buy the house you've always wanted. And even though everything looks just perfect, don't do it. Because they don't want to see you move on to good and better things. So, so amazing. Obi-Wan, wow, yeah, you're here. Good to see you. Huda, good to see you. <laughs> Janae, okay, this is the funny part, right? And I don't mean to be mean. But sometimes narcissists make me laugh or, you know, inside. I may not laugh at their face, but inside I'm just like, oh, my gosh, are you serious? Janaea says, I'm so removed now that when I say no to someone and they are a narc, watching their face contort is fun, really fun. Yes, right? You're just like, wow, I did not expect that kind of reaction from a crazy, I mean, yeah, from a crazy person, yes, but still you don't expect that kind of reaction. Uh, they just cannot understand you not believing them and not giving in to what they want. Yeah, you guys. <laughs> Obi-Wan says, if you, if you pray for them, pray they leave you alone. Yeah, that's a good prayer. Cassie says, a narc will never change. Pray all you can. They won't change. You know, that's, that's where I stand. I'm, you know, I'm a Christian. I do believe in God. I do believe in prayer. Uh, I do believe in Jesus, but people and the Holy Spirit and people will tell me that if you just pray enough, you know, if you just and I'm thinking it's more than prayer. It's like it's like trying to pray that this person grows an arm, you know, like someone who has and I understand there are miracles. I understand that, you know, there are stories out there about miracles happening and that's a possibility. But. I'm just telling you, 
I think it's a physical, actual wiring in their head that prevents them. And it, I'm hoping that that's not true, but it sure seems like that's what's going on. Okay, you guys, I am going to go into, I know there's so many other comments here, and maybe I'll be able to get back to them, but I'm going to go into point number four, and then we're going to recap. Point number four is they totally hate, they cannot stand it when you compliment someone else in front of them because they love gossiping and tearing people down, and it just about kills them to build someone up because they think they're far better. They, they can't go along with their narrative of how they're the hero if you're talking about somebody else being a hero, right? They can't go along with how they're the most attractive if you're telling them how attractive you think so-and-so is or how good so-and-so looks or how handsome or beautiful or smart or funny, right? However you compliment somebody else, it, you just watch them. You can see them start to like cringe and like turn their stomach and they just go nuts. It's, it's horrible to say, um, I'm not trying to tell you how to torture a narcissist, but it is torturous to them to listen to compliments about other people because they want you to see that they're as funny as that other person or more funny, right? They want you to believe that they're smarter than this other person that you think is so smart. They want you to believe that they're, they're so much better. They have such better character. They're so much wiser than this other person that you're telling them is so wise. It's just uh, so, so nuts. So when you're aware and you start to see somebody twist and turn because you're complimenting somebody else, you'll see them start playing up to you. You'll see them trying to get your attention. They'll start to um, drop not so subtle hints about how great they are, and what a hero they are in their own story, right? In their own life and how they um, build themselves, they'll build themselves up so that in hopes that you will start you'll, to compliment them instead of the other people. And it's, it is an insecurity, but the hard thing is if it's um, coming out, they c it could come out also as an angry thing. Like they could, it could anger them when you compliment somebody else. And then suddenly they'll turn to you and say things like, well, what do you know about character? What do you know about um, comedy or humor? Your sense of humor sucks. You know, <laughs> they'll start attacking you. It's like, what the heck? You know, I was just saying how funny this other person is, you know, not a big deal. Or they'll say things like, well, yeah, well, that's not my kind of humor anyway. Like, okay, well, doesn't matter what, you know, that's not the point here. <laughs> the point was something was kind of funny. Um, anyway, oh my gosh, you guys, narcissists are so predictable on one hand. Once you see the things that they hate, you start to see why they behave the way they do. Because the way they behave, it's so out of line of what you might think is normal. Like when you tell somebody else that someone's really handsome or someone's really um, pretty or how much you, how smart you think they are or, you know, for going back to school or whatever it is, you know, you're building up this other person and you're saying um, positive things about them. A normal reaction is, yeah, isn't that great? You know, I think that's so awesome that she's going back to school. Not... What the heck does she think she's going to prove by going, you know, I don't think that that um, career that she's choosing or that field is going to do very well at all. You know, they just are negative and they criticize the other person for even trying <laughs> or the field that they're choosing to go into. They'll somehow try to sabotage the, the positivity that you're trying to see in what this person is doing. So once you are aware that they hate hate it when you compliment other people, you'll start to see this come out. You, when you hear other people start putting down people because, you know, you said something positive, I think in your mind you're going to go, whoa, okay, I think I know what this is. This isn't actually about the field they're going into is terrible. It's about this person being jealous 
that person, the first person I'm talking about is getting my compliment. Yep, you guys. Well, those are the four things. I'm going to recap for you and see how you guys are doing here. Yeah. Yeah. You guys, I'm just reading through some of these comments. Oh, yeah. So, T. Thomas says, yes, yeah, they'll play on your low self-worth. That's why it's best to get stronger and heal. And this, I hope, will help you guys heal by getting stronger, by being able to recognize the manipulation. Um, by recognizing their reaction is a ma manipulation. Their reaction is not a normal reaction to any of these four things. So let's recap these. The four things that narcissists hate the most, seeing other people happy or happier than them. That's the way they see it. They think these people are happier than I am. So what they end up doing is they start um, attacking you. They start trying to make you feel like you're not doing as well as they are. Um, or they talk about the other person about, well, they're, they're not, you know, they're not doing as well as I'm doing. So they want to show you and prove to you by social media, by posting pictures, by trying to make um, other people believe and feel like they're not doing as well as the narcissist. So that's a manipulation. That's trying, it's their jealousy coming out. And they're also victim mentality coming out because they they believe they're a victim if somebody else is doing better than them. Like they believe that if somebody else is doing better than them, it takes away from them from them. <laughs> so, which is not true. Like they, you could both do well. You know, there's enough of this world that you can both do well in this world. You can both have a happy life. But to them, if somebody else is doing well, it takes away from their happiness. So when you watch them contort and you watch them manipulate and you watch them exaggerate what they're doing, right? And they're constantly busy and they're always on the go and on the run and because they got to prove to everybody that they're so, their life is so much more fulfilling than everybody else's life. Yeah, it's, it's crazy when you start to see that. Number two is um, you don't believe them. Yeah, they hate it when you don't believe them, even though they lie straight to your face. They cannot stand that. They're, they expect complete and total loyalty from you. Now, their reaction when you don't believe them should be, um, well, why don't you believe me? Or, you know, oh, let me show you, you know, the evidence so that you do believe me. Or, Oh, you know, it's not like you come out and you're like, oh, I don't believe you because you're a narcissist, right? You just go, oh, are you sure? I don't know if that's true. You know, so you question a little bit. And a normal response to that is, oh, well, yeah, I know it's true because, and they give you evidence, right? Or um, whatever it is to, to prove. Or they understand that you might not believe because, yeah, I don't really have the evidence right now, so... Yeah, I can see why you might not believe this, but yeah, anyway, they're okay with it. You know, they're like, well, it doesn't hurt anything and we'll, we can still be friends or whatever. And eventually you'll figure it out. You know, you'll see the proof come around and you, then you'll believe no big deal. A narcissist will be completely offended that you don't believe them. A narcissist will also be offended that you require evidence. A narcissist also will be offended that you will require time to see if this pans out or if the truth is, you know, if what they're saying or doing is really the truth. So yes, once you see them behaving in the way like defensive and aggressive and offensive about you not believing, then you realize this is somebody who is highly offended if you don't believe their lies straight out. And once you see that, oh my gosh, it's harder for them to manipulate you. You're not going to feel guilty because that's another thing they'll try to do. Shame. Remember shame, guilt, and fear. They will try to use that against you. They'll either make you be afraid, like, oh, if you do this, then this is going to happen. So you can't. It's, it's terrible. You're going to hurt yourself. Um, or for fear of losing out or, you know, whatever. But they might also say things to guilt you. 
into believing them. Well, if you love me, you would trust me, you know, and you feel like, oh, I'm such a bad person, you know, of course I love them, so I should just blindly tr believe everything they say, even though the evidence is right in front of my face that it's wrong, it's not true, it's a lie. So when you, when you start to see these reactions come out and they don't make sense to what just happened, then you're going to see that it's a manipulation. It's not a real reaction. It's not a heartfelt reaction that's normal and something that you should entertain. Okay, number three is they hate it when you don't take them seriously or laugh them off or you don't play by their rules, right? You, they tell you what to do. They tell you how to do it and you decide, no, I want to do it my way. And they're like, what? How dare you? And they're offended. That's ridiculous. You know, a person who's offended that you want to do things your own way versus their way is ridiculous. So don't give in to that. You know, recognize it for what it is. It is a manipulation. And it's a manipulation because they expect you. It's tied into their self-worth. They expect to be able to control you. And if they can't control you, then what are they worth, right? Why? Um, it doesn't even make sense to them why you would not do exactly as they tell you because their way is always the best way somehow, right? A normal reaction and a healthy reaction to you wanting to do things your own way. Even though they make a suggestion, you're like, but you know what? I'm going to try it this way. Um, is, oh, okay. You know, just thought I, you know, give you some suggestions, but they're not going to be offended that you didn't take their advice. Uh. <laughs> All right, you guys. Number four. Hold on, you guys. Oh, okay. Number three. Let me restate this one thing too. Part of number three, when you don't take the um, them seriously or you, you discard their suggestions um, or you don't play by their rules is you say no to them. It's, it's okay to say no to them, but they cannot handle that. They don't want you to say no to them. You have to say yes to them all the time. And that's a manipulation. When you see somebody requiring you to always say yes to them, that's a manipulation. So you have to check yourself. You have to check your own self-esteem and wonder, why am I giving in to this person when I don't want to, right? I want to say no, but for some reason, I, I feel like I'm not capable of saying no because they're manipulating you into thinking you're a bad person if you say no to them, if you don't take their advice, if you don't do it their way. Um, they're manipulating you to feel shame or fear that if you do it your way, you're going to fail. Uh, if you do it uh, your way instead of their way, then um, you're a total jerk. You know, they, 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 they attack you. It, it is not a normal reaction to you wanting to do things your way, okay? Okay, so number four was that you compliment someone else in front of them, okay? So normally when you hear a compliment about somebody else, you're like, ah, oh, you know, you, you take it into consideration. This person's a, an amazing actress, you know, like, okay, yeah, they're pretty good. You know, I've seen some good things, but there I've seen some bad things. Um, but you're not going to be like, oh, yeah. Well, she's ugly. <laughs> what, that, what does that have to do with her being a great actress, right? It's the narcissist or insecure or toxic person's way of tearing down somebody that they somehow believe they're in competition with. So they hate it when you compliment somebody else because in their minds, they are in competition with everybody. Everybody else has to be below them. Everybody else cannot be as good looking as them, cannot be as intelligent as they are, cannot be as lucky as they are, cannot be as whatever it is, you know, they, they just feel like they're the cream of the crop and they're super special. So other people cannot be super special. They're the ones who are super special. So when their reaction is so out of line, when you say something positive about somebody and they come out and they're like, they come out attacking that other person or even attacking you for having that opinion of that person, then you know they're manipulating. They're trying to manipulate their way back to the top so that they can appear like the hero, the better person, the whatever it is, you know, the top. So, well, you guys, that is my talk today about the four things that narcissists hate most. 
And I hope that it helps you to see when people react in such a bad way to those four things, that something else is going on here. Some manipulation is, is coming into play, right? And in that instance, when you're still tempted to fall in line with them and give in to them, ask yourself, why? Why am I doing that? Why am I still tempted to fall in line with this person, um, to believe them and to, to trust them? Why, you know, even though I know they're flat out lying to me. And a lot of that has to do with your self-esteem. And it's so important. I'm so glad uh, you guys were saying this uh, in here. It is important to work on yourself, to, to get stronger, to build your self-esteem, because that is going to set you free from the manip manipulation. And that's going to actually open your eyes to their manipulation. So you're not blinded anymore. You won't be blinded by fear, shame, or guilt because you're going to have a healthy self-esteem. Now, there are times to feel ashamed about something, you know, when you know you did something wrong, when you cheated on someone, when you stole from someone. There is a time to feel shame. There is a time to feel guilt, right? But the guilt and shame that narcissists try to put on you is purely manufactured for their benefit. It's purely manufactured out of you, you're supposed to be loyal to them. And when you're not loyal to them, you're a bad person. You know, that's the kind of guilt they'll put on you. Like, you, and you'll actually believe I'm a bad person by saying no. And that's not true. You're not a bad person for saying no to a narcissist. You're not a bad person to say no to someone who you don't feel like giving something to. It's okay to say no. Um, so you guys, blessings to you. I really hope that this has helped. I want to catch up on a couple more comments here, you guys. <laughs> yeah, it's about control. It's so crazy. They have to control. I'm just reading some of these comments about that. Wow. Oh, Cassie, you're from the Netherlands. Oh, so cool. I'm glad you were able to join us. Huda says, love you guys all, heart, heart. Love you guys too. Aw, this is awesome. You guys, thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate you, you coming on here and sharing your stories and your insights and your own experiences because this is how we learn and this is also how we get stronger, right? We see how we were weak um, and how another person was weak and how we gave in to our weaknesses, right? At the time, we gave in to the temptations or the, the lies and the manipulation. Uh, it happens. Don't beat yourself over, uh, up over it. Just recognize that it was a lie. It was a manipulation. And now you know so much better. You're going to do great. Keep working on yourself. Ask yourself the hard question, you know, why was I tempted? to do the wrong things? Why was I tempted to do things against what I wanted to do? Um, was it my self-esteem? And if it is your self-esteem, dig into that. Find out why you feel so bad about yourself. Why is it, you know, is there a reason for that? A lot of times, really, the, the low self-esteem is not justified. A lot of times it is just not, it's not justified. But if it is, like part of it is, you know, I don't feel like I'm smart. And I didn't do very well at school. And so you have lo low self-esteem. But guess what? You can still learn. You can still go back to school. You can still build that part of you up that you feel bad about. Okay? And you can read. You know, you read all kinds of books. You don't even have to be in school to read, right? Uh, get a library card. Get smarter. Then you won't feel like you're, you know, I hate to say it, but like, you know, you won't feel like you're the dumbest person in the room or whatever it is that's pulling at your self-esteem, whatever you're, you're struggling with, with your self-esteem. You can fix that. You can change your life. You, you know, you can rebuild. And that's what I want to empower you guys to do. I don't want you to be manipulated by a narcissist, but I also don't want you to be an enabler and a supply to a narcissist because of your low self-esteem. So blessings, you guys. I hope you have a great week and I will catch up with you again next week.